Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for those who are online for attending that way as well. Today, we are really um, honored and, and, and pleased to host our very own um, Penn Mellon Dispossessions in the Americas postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Belen Unsueta, um, to give an internal speaker series talk which is titled Indigeneity as a Field of Opinion, a Regional Cleavage in Contemporary Bolivia. Um, many of you know Belen Sueta since she has been with us for over a year, but let me remind you, she has a PhD in sociology from the Department um, of, uh, sorry, from the University of Princeton. Her research interests include cultural sociology, uh, social inequality, and race and ethnicity in Latin America. Uh, Belen uh, comes from Chile, where she completed her undergraduate degree in social Anthropolo anthropology at the Universidad de Chile, and an MA in sociology at the Universidad Católica de Chile, where we also have collaborators. Um, her doctoral dissertation examined consensus over ethno-racial categories in Chile and Bolivia, using survey experiments and historical research. Belen has held fellowships at the Princeton Program in Latin American Studies and the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Um, as I mentioned, she began her postdoctoral fellow here, fellowship here at Penn in fall of 2022. It's really a pleasure for us to be able to see some of your ongoing research. So, Although there are now so many hands in the room, please join me in welcoming Belen. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Tulia, for that generous introduction. Um, very happy to be here at Penn over a year now. So. I've really enjoyed this time. So I'm also happy to present today um, on the work uh, I did for my dissertation. I had hoped that this would be sort of like a practice job talk. In truth, as I started preparing this presentation, the paper went like backwards <laughs> and went back to like a state of work in progress instead of like being a paper that I that I send out. So. Well, yeah, that's what happens uh, when you revise your work, <laughs> right? Uh, so this, as Tulia said, this, this presentation is called Indigeneity as a Field of Opinion, a Regional Cleavage in Contemporary Bolivia. There it is. Okay, so a brief overview. Uh, I'll just briefly tell you about my motivation for this work. I will tell you a little about Bolivian regionalism, uh, the research design that I use for this, this particular paper, and that research design divides this in two, sort of in two parts, one about the location of the boundary and the other one about the meaning of the boundary. And I will end with just like a few remarks on what a field of opinion is and why I think it's a useful concept. So, well, the original, one of the original motivations for this particular paper was Andreas Beamer's theory of ethnic boundaries. And this is very famous theory of ethnic boundaries and ethnic, uh, and the ethnic boundary making uh, by Andreas Beamer, very famous in sociology. And this is sort of like one of those theories that are constantly cited and quoted and and sort of like an important and in this theory he poses sort of in his sort of framework of ethnicity he says okay so boundaries are actually sort of like the outcome of conflict and negotiations between people and people have like different like actors will have very different sort of strategies in this field so the uh and he said then eventually these different strategies might give rise to what he calls a cultural consensus, which in turn is sort of what explains the different characteristics of ethnic boundaries in his theory. So this was my sort of original 
one of the original motivations. And the question behind it is like, is it the, what that I asked myself is like, is it really, is a theory based on consensus really a good theory for racial inequality? So that's sort of like the idea where it started. But this is very sociological. And I, I also have like other motivations. I was very interested in Bolivian regionalism. So Bolivia has had historically have had like different times where regionalism is very important. In the last few decades, and especially starting in the 1990s, uh, there were a lot of like new introduction of new sort of like democratization policies. They created many new municipalities, and this sort of accelerating the de accelerated the death of the end of the sort of like traditional party system in Bolivia. It brought to life uh, a whole host of like new participants in Bolivian politics, including, of course, famously Evo Morales, right? Um, yeah, so this is coming from the 1990s, and eventually this will lead to the famous uh, Cochabamba water wars and the huge sort of like social turmoil that was in Bolivia in the early 2000s. And out of this turmoil came sort of like the idea of a new constitutional convention, which seems to be a common thread among Latin American countries, yes, huge turmoil and new constitution. And in this case, it took like they started like this new law was in 2005 and eventually it will be sort of approved in 2009. So it was sort of a four year process of constitutional discussion. And, and all these changes in the early 2000s and going into this like new constitution really put set apart like a new sort of iteration of Bolivian regionalism and divided the country sort of like which is officially divided in nine departamentos is it, this divide uh, unofficially divided the country sort of in two large areas so uh, to the west is the Altiplano uh, which is the uh, includes all uh, the Andes and the very large historical indigenous population of both Quechua and Aymara mostly people and then to the east is what is called the Media Luna, which are sort of like the lowlands of Bolivia and that include both the Amazon, the Chaco, sort of all the lower lands to the, to the east of the Andes. And so these two regions became really, so these two, like this unofficial division became really like this, a source of tension. Eventually, in the middle of like the discussion about like the constitution uh, to Chuquisaca, which would have been traditionally an altiplano departamento, started sort of switching towards sort of the Melia Luna in certain aspects. It's still very divided in between like urban and rural, but that was like a new, a new innovation of this new regionalism, regionalism right? That especially after like the constitution, the new constitution, and after sort of like Evo Morales uh, first administrations, like this, like there's a, like, there came like a new sort of discussion about what it meant to be indigenous and who was indigenous in the country. So that was really among sort of like the core discussions about this regionalism. Okay, so I, I used a survey, I conduct, I collected data in, in October 2020. Uh, there was a survey in three Bolivian departamentos, like the, the urban areas of three departamentos, which are La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz, um, included, uh, only including like uh, adults in urban areas. So La Paz includes both El Alto and La Paz. Cochabamba is just Cochabamba and Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. And um, well, these are all very different regions, right? Uh, and the most obvious difference uh, is sort of in terms of the ethnic composition of the population. So this is from the sample, but it's very similar to sort of census uh, um, numbers. <clears throat> 
and you see that in La Paz we have like a, this this question is uh, is answering a question about belonging to indigenous peoples. So, do you consider yourself to belong to some of the following peoples? So, in La Paz, in the Departamento de La Paz, it's mostly Aymara people, people who self-identify as indigenous and self-identify as belonging to Aymara people, Aymara. In Cochabamba, we also have like a big predominance of people who self-identify as indigenous, but they are mostly from the Quechua nation. And then Santa Cruz, is like most people will not self-identify with an indigenous people. And you see that I like the other two, even though like Quechua and Aymara, like the Quechua would be like the largest minority, like the other column is sort of like important in this side, right? Because most of the indigenous, not most, but a large part of indigenous people, indigenous nations in the Media Luna are sort of smaller indigenous nations as compared to the Quechua and Aymara, right? Because of internal migration, we have a lot of Quechua and Aymara people in Santa Cruz, but this would have been a more recent uh, development, right? Um, so what I wanted to look here, this is sort of like the main research question is that if there are any regional differences in the location and meaning of the indigenous, non-indigenous boundary in contemporary Bolivia. So this idea of like the location and the meaning of the boundary again comes from Andreas Beamer's theory of ethnic boundary making. And basically he says like there, yeah, consensus over boundaries, what he, what I was talking at the beginning, right? If there's cons the consensus over boundaries, you can divide it like largely in two, sort of like there can be consensus over the location of the boundary, meaning mostly who belongs to each side of the boundary, who gets to be a member of each group. And then the other aspect, the other dimension of it is the meaning of the boundary, which is mostly about the legitimate consequences of the boundary. And for me, like, this is mostly about, like the second question is mostly like about uh, ethnic inequality, right? Is it like what, what, what's, yeah, how legitimate it is or what are like the, the understandings that people have about like the differences between like the socioeconomic differences between groups. So let me start with the location of the boundary. So most of this, uh, both uh, Beamer's theory and my own work really starts from uh, Pierre Bourdieu's uh, understanding of struggles over classifications. And in the case of struggles over ethnic and regional identities, it's sort of what Bourdieu says like is that people are struggling really for these tiny little properties that are linked to sort of like ethnic origin. So sort of what are the markers really? And what's the meaning of those markers uh, for people, right? And um, yeah, so and the idea is that like if you you could like the goal, the ultimate goal is to try to have like a monopoly over sort of like what is the legitimate division of the social world. Now this is mostly a struggle and like the idea of like, can you ever get to that monopoly is sort of like a similar question that can you ever get like consensus over this stuff. So that's where it goes. So, and for this, I used like a vignette experiment. This is a survey experiment, like the more technical uh, uh, aspect of this is that this was a two to the power of six factorial design. Uh, because like the full factorial design would need 64 vignettes per person. I decided to use a confounded plot design so I could like divide people in groups and just assign a smaller set of vignettes to each group. And this is an example of the vignettes that people were given, right? So people were given this sort of small paragraph. This is what the vignette is. And with six main characteristics defined, uh, describing a person, and then they would be asked if they consider this person to be indigenous, right? So in this example, Antonio Condori is this a man of dark skin color, black eyes. He grew up in an urban area, Western Bolivia. 
in his childhood, he learned to speak an indigenous language, language and he is interested in indigenous traditions and culture. Would you identify Antonio as an indigenous person? So the six dimensions. Sorry, can I ask a clarification question? Yes. Um, so when you say in groups, those are grouped by last name? Um, no, they are randomly divided. Like the entire sample is randomly divided in eight. So that's where I'm going. So the, the treatments are like the different dimensions of the vignettes. So these are six dimensions, which are all the ones that are uh, so bold. Yeah, yeah. So, so here, here is the same, right? So like the, the six dimensions are this surname, which uh, the vignette would have either an indigenous or a non-indigenous name physical appearance, which uh, people were described as either having dark or light skin color, some social cultural elements such as mother tongue, this person learned an indigenous language, an interest in tradition, and then two geographic variables to sort of like, uh, to take a look at this sort of regional dif differences. So uh, people were described as either from Western or Eastern Bolivia, and they were described uh, as even urban or rural status. So these six dimensions are the treatment in this experiment. Yeah. And since they are evaluated jointly, you can sort of like, you keep sort of like the relational aspects between these different um, dimensions, which is sort of like one of the um, advantages of like vignette experiments. Because you could like ask all of this separately but then it would have been, yeah. you would miss that idea of like, this are being, this is happening all at the same time. And, and you're not making a decision on each trait, but you're making a decision based on all of these traits. Okay, this is for the more quantitatively, quantitatively inclined people. <laughs> so like the model that I used to, like the statistical model that I used to analyze the data is called a finite mixture model because I'm trying to look for like what we call an observed heterogeneity. And the idea is like the most, so if you ever use a logistic regression, you usually are sort of analyzing what you think is a dis like this distribution and you're trying to get the parameters of that distribution, right? Of the binomial distribution in our logistic regression. In the case of finite mixture models, like what we do, like what we're trying to look, the setting is that you have a mixture of different distributions. So in this case, I took this to be a mixture of different logistic sort of binomial distributions. And well, what this do uh, through the expectation, uh, the EM algorithm, um, is sort of finding like the probability that any of these observations belong to any of these different distributions and not just to one, which is sort of like the classic logistic regression. Well, the criteria for selection obviously is highly technical and it has to do with sort of this information criteria and sort of based on this, I decided on my final model. And my final model gives me sort of three main components, meaning when I analyze the data from this experiment, asking people uh, to say if someone is or not indigenous, sort of I can separate them in the analysis, sort of like the impact of all these dimensions separately. And it turns out that I have like three mixtures with three specific mixtures of sort of models of indigeneity. The first and the largest model of indigeneity is one that includes sort of like everything. So for this, um, for, for this component, all of these dimensions are important, especially the urban rural status. So this, that's, uh, but the interesting part of here is that, so there's an interaction between the region. So people were described from either Western or Eastern Bolivia. So there's an interaction between that region and the city of the respondent. So what is telling us is that in this case, since um, the category of reference is La Paz, so for in people in La Paz, 
region being described from either Eastern or Western Bolivia is not really a significant determinant, if I will say, if this is or not an indigenous person. But the interaction with Cochabamba and Santa Cruz sort of say a different thing. So for them, and for Cochabamba, it's not really significant. This is sort of like, uh, so, uh, but the important thing is that for people in Santa Cruz, this is like a large um, <laughs> negative uh, uh, coefficient, right? So meaning that people who are in Santa Cruz, when they are asked to, evaluate, uh, to say if someone is or is not indigenous, if that person is being described as coming from Western Bolivia, they're highly likely to say that, yes, this is an indigenous person, as opposed to people who are described from coming from Eastern Bolivia. This doesn't really happen in La Paz and Cochabamba. For people in La Paz and Cochabamba is really not significant if someone is from either uh, East, Eastern or Western Bolivia. So they consider indigenous people from anywhere. So I have, so I call this component traditionalists because they have like this large uh, rural component and they look at ancestry and they look at skin color. So it seems very traditionalist to me. And every, this component, this would, this would be right, like the image of ethnicity. So it would be like dark skin people in some rural area in Western Bolivia. In this case, these are Kendra children. The question is if people from the Amazon are considered indigenous. So for people, and this is this is what is interesting about this interaction. So for people in La Paz and Cochabamba, they would say that these are indigenous people, but not people in Santa Cruz. Not because these are not indigenous people, or at least this is my interpretation of it. I think that people in Santa Cruz and, and people in the east of the country have like different understand this of ethnicity. And they make a distinction between the like, Quechua and, it, and Aymara nations and the rest of it, the indigenous peoples of Bolivia. So I think they would say, yes, these people are indigenous, but not in the same way that someone that a uh, Quechua or an Aymara person would be. So I think this is sort of, so again, everyone would sort of coincide that this, yes, these people should be termed indigenous. The question is, are these people indigenous? And again, for La Paz, yes. For people in Santa Cruz, no. This is a different kind of ethnicity that doesn't come under the umbrella term indigenous person, as it is used in Bolivia. Mostly, and I use the term indigenous people because this is a term that they use usually, and it's also the term that is on the constitution. So, but this understanding that like the umbrella term indigenous seems to be pointing to two different models of ethnicity. So the second component is for people who only care about uh, tradition. So anyone who is um, described as being interested in tradition will quickly be categorized as indigenous. Uh, the interesting part about this one is this interaction right with the cities uh, means that this large component of interest in tradition is mostly for La Paz and the, the interaction is negative with, uh, with both Cochabamba and Santa Cruz, meaning that the, that the effect is smaller, right? So I tend to look at this component as sort of, I call them the culturalist, but I might, like, I feel like Evo Morales and this picture would be the image of them. Like, these are people who really embrace sort of like visible cultural elements in order to sort of uh, say they're indigenous, which is very much the case of Evo Morales, right? So, and the effect being stronger in La Paz is even more significant since La Paz is sort of like the stronghold of sort of like mass, which is Evo Morales party. Um, and the third component is one that mostly looks at ancestry and skin color, but not urban. That's the most important thing. 
there's th this last understanding of ethnicity is an understanding of ethnicity that, that includes ancestry, that includes skin color, but does not, definitely not include the urban rural status as an important determinant of ethnicity. And in here, well, this is a smaller component. So in terms of like standard errors, things are more difficult, but, but yeah, like the idea being this, that uh, like there are less interactions. So this is sort of like a model that is more, I don't know, homogeneous over regions. But yeah, but this definitive idea that this are not rural people. So I take it to be sort of very much the idea of El Alto in Bolivia, which is like very much sort of like uh, the place of like urban ethnicity, like the urban indigenous people. We, um, I also had another picture of, uh, with Roberto Mamani Mamani's murals, and I had it for like, a couple of years ago. <laughs> I took it out, but, but it's sort of that idea that indigeneity, especially in like in the Andes, right, can be an urban phenomena just like any other, right? And not in, and indigenous people are not at all necessarily tied to the idea of being urban peasant, I mean rural peasants of any kind. So the meaning of the boundary as I said before has to do with sort of what are the legitimate consequences of this distinction between indigenous and non-indigenous people. So I used two questions that were first used by Tejas and Bailey in a different article. So it, I wanted to have some sort of like comparability there. And they used these two questions to sort of like measure beliefs about racial inequality and stratification. And the first is one is this, is this question about indigenous people, according to a census are poor. Why do you think that What's the main reason for this? And there are five different uh, answers. So because they do not work, work hard enough, because they are less intelligent, because they are treated unfairly, because they have a low educational level, and because they do not want to change the culture. So those are all the alternatives people were given. And the second item is um, belief about discrimination. And it's basically, do you believe that indigenous people are treated much better, better, the same, worse, or much worse? Than white people in Bolivia, right? Um, so, and the result from this is that so we, we I divide these answers in sort of two types of stratification beliefs, right? One are belief like structure that inequality is structural, which is related to uh, because they are treated unfairly and because they have low educational level. So those two answers are sort of structural explanations. And the other three are all sort of individual explanations of inequality, right? Because they don't work hard enough, they're not intelligent, or they don't want to change the culture. So most people will, in Bolivia will give a structural reason. However, like still a lot of people that will give you an individual reason and the main individual reason is the idea that they don't want to change the culture so again this idea like very latin american and this uh, prejudice of indigenous people uh, sort of like lazy and entrenched in very old ways so this is sort of like the first logistic regression that i will show you and the sort of trying to explain the structural reason. So, uh, so I have two models, but I, I almost keep the differences. <laughs> yeah. We have time for questions as we go. I can wait until the end. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, um, you're welcome. The book. previous slide, um, specifically the, the answer is because they do not want to change their culture strikes me as like an outlier in the responses, and that like is about freedom of choice. And it almost, my question is like, how, how do, how do you and how do your um, or, uh, survey drivers, specific respondents, sort of define this question? What would it mean if they didn't change their culture? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I mostly divided this following the, the other paper, Tejas and Bailey, so I did not really uh, uh, sort of classify these questions out of nowhere. I'm just like following the precedent in that sense. 
But the idea that they don't want to change the culture is like most, I think this, you mean that is, is this an individual or a structural or is it like a third option that is not here? I think mean just like, what does that mean to people? Like, I don't want to change their culture. So if they chose to dress differently, then they would be richer. Like, like that's sort of the event statement? More or less, yeah. Okay, no, thanks, that's, that's helpful. <laughs> More or less, and this, as I said, this is sort of like a common prejudice in Latin America about indigenous people, that they are entrenched in a culture that is not one that leads to sort of uh, social mobility or anything, right? So it's really their culture. What is the problem? Thank you. So yeah, of course, in this case, so I have three types of uh, predictors. So like the, their self-identification, their education and the region. And as you see, like self-identification is not a significant predictor. Education is not a significant predictor. A region is certainly uh, a big predictive dimension of this. And what this is saying is that, you know, so people in both Cochabamba and Santa Cruz would be less likely to identify a structural explanation for inequality, as opposed to people in Santa Cruz, who, who are the people who are sort of like the category of reference in this case. And the second sort of like meaning of the boundary has to do with the belief about discrimination. And <clears throat> this question, indigenous people are treated much better, better, the same, worse, much worse. And sort of like, the, I, I, this is also divided in two, so I can do the logistic regression. And this is sort of like negative discrimination versus sort of there is positive or at least non, or, or at least neutral discrimination, right? So most people will say again that like, um, that indigenous people, indigenous people are treated, treated worse or much worse, right? And really like the people who say that they're treated better is like around 10%, but still this is a lot compared to other countries. In most countries, this number will be zero. Like no one will think that indigenous people are treated better than, than whites in their country. Sorry, um, the survey was from 2013. My survey is for 2020. This, this is from 2020. 2020, okay. Yeah. So the paper from 2013 is a paper that collected, in, uh, that used information collected in 2010, so 10 years before. And in that paper, which used many countries, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm only using one, but Bolivia is sort of like a big outlier in this case, in this question specifically. It's sort of like the only country where it happens that people will say that, yeah, indigenous people are treated better. So again, this leads to this dichotomous distinction of negative and positive discrimination. A year later. Yeah, so a year later, um, <laughs> everything was so difficult doing the survey because I had to move the survey because of what happened of, in October of 2019. And then I have to move it again because of the pandemic. So there was, yeah, there was a lot there happening. But the idea is that this happened after sort of like the latest uh, troubles of E. Morales. Like when he left, this happened after he left Bolivia, after the election of 2019. And I always thought that this could, I mean, it can certainly change how people think about this stuff. But I feel like that there's still so much, like that 10% of the people are still saying that the indigenous people are treated better. For me, it's like very uh, surprising because this is after Evo Morales, right? Austin. So, yeah. So, well, I did the same. So a logistic regression using uh, self-identification, education and region. And we see more or less the same that self-identification is not really a significant predictor. 
this is just like a 90% interval, so I don't take it. I don't, uh, secondary education is not important. And here, the most important thing is like this difference with Santa Cruz as compared to, again, La Paz. Uh, Cochabamba, since this is not really significant, is not really different from La Paz. But Santa Cruz, the people in Santa Cruz has like larger chances of saying that indigenous people are treated worse. But this is at the same time, the people who think that uh, their inequality doesn't come from structural reasons. So it's sort of like an interesting thing happening in Santa Cruz of how they explain or their or their understanding of how like in a, where like the sources of inequality comes from. And um, yeah, well, so that's the last from the results. And um, you should have, I'm missing a, uh, a slide where I want to do like a little summary of this. But the idea is that there are definitive regional patterns to both the location and the meaning of the boundary. So both in the idea of how people classify indigenous people and how they are, how they justify or how they explain indigenous inequality have a lot to do with where people are and even over sort of self-identification and education, which they use and Bailey use it as a measure of class, right? So this would be that ethnicity is not important, class is not important and region over those. Um, so there's very little consensus over this stuff. And I have a different paper, like measuring consensus directly. It's a really very small consensus. And we have a theory of, of ethnic boundaries that is based on a theory of cultural compromise slash consensus, which he doesn't make a big distinction between. Uh, and the idea is he says that interest of people who like, uh, you can achieve consensus because interest overlap, there can be interest overlap. And this is sort of like very influenced by Rawls concept of overlapping consensus. But then Rawls concept of overlapping consensus comes from a history of European religious diversity and how that came to a consensus about justice. I don't think ethnic diversity leads to consensus about inequality. So truly my, my problem with this theory is that this is, that consensus would never be able to account for, for the way we explain inequality. So that's my problem with this theory. And those are sort of like the main um, questions that I do. And I mean, this last part is, has a lot to do with the part that I'm reworking. <laughs> so that's why I just have a few questions about this right now, but I'm like working on this, on this idea. I'm not a big roles reader, but I think it's interesting that this is really this, this theory, like Wimmer's theories, it really based on this idea. And I feel that religious diversity in Europe is very different from ethnicity in other places. And I'm not sure if that is the best theory that we could get for ethnic boundaries. So, um, and lastly, sort of, I like with this concept of field of opinion, it barely appears in his theory. He mentioned this like once, but the idea is that in, in a field of opinion, you have like contest, contestation of like the, what Thimer considers the consensus. So and you have a very sort of like a much, a better model, I think, of sort of discussing what happens uh, mostly about the meaning of boundaries. So the idea that there is a um, sort of, there will be a group of people who will always sort of like defend the doxa, which is sort of like the orthodoxy, and there will be sort of another group that will question that, which is heterodoxy. But again, as I said, this is something that is sort of, I'm still working on this last part, this more theoretical part. Um, Oh, yeah, that is, that is it, thank you. <laughs>
No, no, no. This is sort of like another aspect of the results that I don't think I presented. But uh, yeah, so the models here give gives us sort of like a posterior probability of the chances of belonging to one of this. So it doesn't really assign people deterministically. So it's not like a third of the sample is assigned here, a third of the sample here, and a third. So, but you can assign people to the largest probability and then say, okay. If I assign them to the largest probability component, like what is the like, how many people? And that is in that question, in that case, um, I don't, can I still share? Well, uh, in that case, like the first component is the largest. Like it changes a lot because these models, every time you add uh, a new independent variable, these models like will rerun and give you like results so you can't sort of like there's no set of these variables in here so every time you're adding a new variable like results have changed the groups the grouping are changing so it's difficult to compare but definitely the first group is the largest and depending on how i measure it like around 70 percent of the the sample can goes to that first listen the culturalist is the smallest and the, again depending on how i measure that they are mostly in la paz so yeah so for me, the cultural is, and that's why I use sort of Evo Morales sort of picture, because for me, sort of, it seems like a very militant mass definition of being indigenous, because it also uses sort of what it is arguably the la, sort of like the, the most subjective of all of the sort of different criteria, which is interest in tradition, which is, what is that, right? Um, and then the, the last group is sort of like a smaller group, but larger the, than the culturalists. And they are also a lot from La Paz, but a lot from Cochabamba too. And this is people, it's not that they think that indigenous people are urban, it's that they don't make a distinction between urban and rural. You can be equally indigenous in urban and in rural contexts. So that's, that's the main difference of the third component, which is around like 20% of the sample. May I ask a two fingers question? Do you think that these, um, these uh, I don't know if you call it typology, but these, um, um, these interactions of factors that you see coming together in these different profiles of mm -hmm. how people Central do you think they work in other contexts? Like if you were to apply them in Chile or in Argentina or in other places, or do you think they are Bolivia specific? I think a lot of this, the 
So I've done, like, in my dissertation, I did also did this experiment in Chile, and I get sort of similar results also because I'm very, using very similar criteria in both, right? Uh, nevertheless, like, they're always slightly different. And I think one of the more sort of, like, unique things about Bolivia was this idea, like, that there's a group of people who don't see indigenous people as sort of necessarily rural people. I think that was very specific. I don't know specifically Bolivian, but at least at this point in time, I think Bolivia is definitely a place where you can be an urban indigenous person, right? And that not necessarily happens everywhere. Um, and the other is that there will always be people who, who concentrate on interest in tradition. But in the case of Bolivia, it was mostly concentrated on like lower education. I suppose where in Chile is like the more educated people who will say, oh, culture is sort of like the distinctive criteria for an indigeneity. So I think that was also sort of like interesting, sort of like in the comparative terms. Yeah? Bueno, la damas primero, Carolina. But um, I'm going to make one question specifically related to the Bolivian context. And um, it's this idea of how, how indigenous people are seen in the colonial context. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a particularly piece of question that you bring on how, um, if, um, like, if, if people would say that they were treated better or worse. Or, and in some cases, I believe, I mean, I don't know if I'm taking an assumption, but in some cases, I believe people would say that they're treated better because they have, because they have all this institutional support to mm -hmm. support the, for having an indigenous person, um, which is, which is crucial because it, it is a, it's a true thing. Real things, it is still, there, there's still a very Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was wondering how is this, like the, the, the case from the institutional, like yeah, the institutional case in, in this case in Bolivia, like how how uh, would, would they would they treat better um, an indigenous community when they have such problems with an indigenous community? I think that that would change the way the like. It, it is perceived if if they're treated better or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that that was yeah. my question. Well, so or like, uh, so Tejas and Bailey do have data on Colombia, and and the number who say better is much smaller. But also that's 2010. So I don't know what it would be today. Um, but certainly, I feel that in many places, people have this idea that there is a fair unfair institutional advantage for indigenous people and especially since sort of like the 1990s and, and now right which is sort of being defined as the sort of the emerges emergence of indigeneity in latin america sort of and i think that happens in many places and there are a lot of people who would say yes like they definitely had a lot of this unfair advantages and they have like special programs in truth most places don't have like there's no really advantage to anything. So in Bolivia though, the thing is that we have a country that had an indigenous president. And that I feel it's a huge break with anything happening anywhere else in Latin America. So I think like this idea of people being treated better has to do with, again, sort of like what happened starting like the early 2000s until today has to do a lot with that. So MAS, which is the main party, is the only national party that exists in Bolivia, right? There are no more national parties in Bolivia, only MAS. All the other parties are regional. Um, and sort of like this, like it's really sort of like an idea of in, like the empowering of indigenous people. Does that really translate into some like material advantage? Not really, not at all. Especially if you say, okay, let's take into account the cumulative effect of all of this stuff. Certainly not. 
but the like the political break of having an indigenous president, I think, is what's what's really happening there, or like at least the entire like mass movement and their come to power, like how they came to power. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, uh, okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit more historicizing kind of that switch over from rural to urban um, indigeneity uh, in a lot of people's minds, because like I'm thinking about the material transformations that happened under the Morales government where you have a larger like um, middle class Cholita com um, communities in La Paz. And so I was wondering if you could just provide a little bit more history in um, how you see those material transformations shaping some of the um, perceptions of um, indigeneity outside of the places where um, broad kind of understandings of indigeneity were localized in like the Chapati and other places, right? Like, and so, um, yeah, can you help us historicize yeah. that? It's not my area of ex expertise, I will say, but um, the rural, the at like indigenous rural urban phenomena in, in Bolivia is sort of it's, I, I would say sort of at least like a, that's a sort of century long. If you, I'm not, I, I will concentrate sort of like in the sort of like the rise or the, yeah, the rise of like El Alto, if you think about that. So El Alto didn't exist in 1900. And it's just like in the 1920s, 1930s, that it starts like a small population. And today is one of the largest cities of Bolivia, right? Uh, it's only if I'm not wrong, like uh, El Alto has been a municipality since I think like 35, 30 something years. So it's, compared to like the history of like El Alto as like a growing city and what it be, even became a municipality is like a big, I feel it's a big difference. But it's certainly like I feel it has to do a lot with the internal migration of from the Andes to other places too. You know, Evo Morales is like supposed to be, like not supposed to be, he's a, of like, uh, he says that he belongs to the Aymara nation, but yet he lives in Cochabamba, right? Which is sort of mostly a Quechua place. And his whole career more than indigenous was sort of like as a rural, uh, um, see, the union of cocaleros, mm -hmm. right? So it has to, so I don't know, actually, <laughs> I got complicated there. But I feel like this is a long history and it had definitely accelerated since the 90s. Uh, I don't know if you have any more uh, ideas behind that, but it's something that is, I can take a look, definitely. Yeah, um, no, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think there was kind of just, um, I think a, a, part, a part of that question is just like thinking around like the class transformations as they've um, yeah, emerged yeah. and yeah. how they then shape um, some of the, the perceptions um, from, from the data. But that's also, I'm a historian, so that's like, see, you know, it's like all that. of us just like our own disciplines, <laughs> I guess. Um, no, no, I think it's very interesting. And I've, I mean, and I've read mostly about like sort of like the history of El Alto because it seemed to me sort of, sort of paradigmatic sort of like urban history, but I, yeah, I think like, as I said, like there was an important internal migration. And I think that also has to do a lot with sort of like this new status of like this urban status. But yeah, I will take a look definitely because it could be an interesting way of seeing this. Thank you. Okay, I don't think there's questions on Zoom uh, though. Uh, Lucia has a question. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, <laughs> Hi. I don't see you. Where are you? Uh, I'm here on Zoom. I apologize I wasn't able to make it in person today. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Belen. And I was thinking about some of the um, similarities with Peru 
I think your point about um, see indigenous peoples uh, being identified as indigenous within urban spaces is in fact very important, especially given the history in the, of the Andes where there's this racialized geography as Ben Orlov and others have, have noted, Sarah Radcliffe as well, saying that, that indigeneity is so in place that once a person would move to the city, they would no longer be considered indigenous. So to see this ethnic identification in, uh, and that others, and people are not only identifying, but others are identifying them as indigenous in an urban space is quite interesting. Um, the other point that I thought was interesting that you made and I wanted to echo too, is that in Peru, people also make a distinction between um, indigenous and native peoples, indigenous people being from the Andes and native peoples being from the Amazon. So, and there's this whole this whole history of Amazonian peoples sort of being left outside of the realm of indigeneity um, in really interesting ways, even though they have been some of the most fervent voices for indigenous rights and particularly envi around environment and land um, since the 1970s, they've almost you know, been the heart of the, that movement of em environmentalism. Um, but I, my question for you, um, in particular around what we're, we're talking about DOXA and all these sorts of things, I'm, I'm kind of curious about the background around the ethnic boundaries and particularly I'm thinking about it in terms of the law and in terms of what it means. And again, I'm thinking about it from the from the Peruvian uh, example. But for instance, um, and I think your work is a little different because it's talking about how do people identify each other. But I think it's important, as you're saying, too, there's a political aspect to this. Because within international law and even regional agreements, indigenous peoples have rights that non-Indigenous peoples do not in terms of like prior consultation um, and other legal mechanisms to defend uh, place and ways of life. So I guess my question to you is then, how do you see this uh, debate over who's Indigenous, who isn't um, playing out along these larger issues of, of truly politics? So I mean, in, 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 again, just to, to, to finish up in the Peruvian example, you have the divide of indigenous and campesino. Campesino becomes the word that is used to identify indigenous peoples after the agrarian reforms that people are recast as, as peasants. And this currently is having um, serious political repercussions, um, again, because indigenous peoples have rights that non-indigenous peoples don't. So I'm just curious, how, how does that sort of politics around rights uh, play out in your work, or if it does? And thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucia. That's interesting comments. Um, let me start with, the, with your question. Uh, it is definitely, this is very political. Uh, and this sort of was some of the first sort of things that I was looking when I uh, started uh, doing the analysis on Bolivia. Um, it is very much uh, sort of like the basis of many of many political debates in Bolivia. So just to think, I, I mean, from the latest, uh, the 20, if they're going to be a 2023 or 2024 census, it's a big political discussion. And the census always brings the question of, should we include the category mestizo? So this is something that ha that is always, uh, not always, but it's sort of like in the latest Sort of from the last three decades, each census has brought sort of like the same question, the same discussion, and it sort of had this, not the same, but different political implications in each case, but it has a lot to do with, right, how many people are going to self-identify as indigenous, because that will give mass huge power because they always are taken to be sort of like the political basis of mass. They are not necessarily, it's not necessarily true, but that is certainly one of like taking for granted ideas in Bolivia, I think. The most indigenous people will like vote for mass and everyone. I mean, maybe that's changing right now, but I, uh, it's also like when you ask about the campesinos, like certainly this is also part of like the political discussion. And if you think going back to the constitutional convention, it was sort of like the Bolivians who made up this uh, Naciones Campesinas Originarias term 
I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, the peasant, indigenous, uh, original communities, something like that. So they like the constitution should have made up this 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 new concept precisely because the idea that indigenous people have been equated to peasants and to rural people for so long. Um, yeah. So I think that all of those things are part of this debate. I just, in terms of studying it from the point of view of an ethnic boundary, I guess, it's just like the questions are more, like, I'm trying to concentrate on those. But in other papers, I do talk a lot about this. And I think the other thing interesting, and I think that uh, it, like what is happening in Bolivia is very similar to what you describe in Peru about people making a distinction between the indigenous and natives. I think that's very much what is happening, but only in Santa Cruz, right? In Santa Cruz, there seems to be this double like understanding of ethnicity, one that only applies to the Andes and one that only applies to non-Andes people. Uh, certainly there must be some uh, historical continuities in there, but uh, yeah. Uh, because it also has to do with sort of like the Andes versus the Amazon. And I hadn't thought about it, but you were right. Like they, like the, this have been like actually the people who have been more sort of vocal about some of the more typical, like the environmental and all those kind of issues. So yeah, it's interesting. And I think at least in Bolivia, again, because of like the, uh, the political implications, it had a lot to do with with the Tipnis Park. I don't know if any of you remember this, but yeah, at some point this uh, protected indigenous nature park in Bolivia, uh, the government of Evo Morales said that, okay, we'll build a highway splitting this place in two, right? And there was like a huge movement from indigenous people from those places, right? Against sort of mass and Evo Morales. So I think that's where like this differences come started like appearing. I mean, especially because of sort of like the disregard over sort of like the environmental aspects of sort of development in the sort of non-Altiplano region, right? It seemed to have been like a lesser thing. Okay, this is the deepness, it's not the Andes, let's cut it in two. I don't know, but yeah. No, right, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. It makes a lot of sense. And I mean, just in the histories of both countries, you see a lot of people go um indigenous to the andes going down into the amazon and exploiting mining some of the the worst like just human trafficking atrocities in peru yeah. um are committed by indigenous peoples coming down to uh work in, in the or who are kind of running these camps and mm -hmm. you know and trafficking women and things like that so you the the politics of it all are incredibly fraught um, so, but thank you so much for, for your talk and for your insights. Thank you, Lucia. I think my question though might be self-evident or sort of, so you don't have to, you, give your, you may have already answered this, but I, the, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was fascinating. And um, uh, next semester, my class is representing Bolivia. So I want to learn more about Bolivia again. Um, so in the model OAS class. But I, I think I want to know if in your paper, do you talk a little bit more about, and maybe it's self-evident, right, the dominant politics, because I, I went to Bolivia in 2019 to monitor mm -hmm. elections, and I did notice I was placed in Santa Cruz to monitor elections, and I noticed many people, you know, just, pers I, th I thought there were many indigenous people, but it was interesting in the beginning of your presentation, you were saying how many people in Santa Cruz, which I also got a sense from being there, didn't identify as indigenous. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I think you may be in your paper, but it seems maybe self-evident that the dominant politics in Santa Cruz is one of the reasons for why people are not identifying or saying they want to identify as Aymara or Quechua, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if you think, um, unless unless you really think there's a, a less people there that are, are tr uh, significantly less people there, or you know, how much do you think that those statistics are there? They just don't want to identify as Aymara and Quechua, which actually makes your other comment about um, that people in Santa Cruz thought that indigenous people were treated worse off. Mm -hmm actually makes rational common sense to me to say, yeah, this group's treated worse off and I'm not this group, right? So, right. That I, so I was thinking that in Santa Cruz, and again, this is what I saw in Santa Cruz though. And um, so do you study like the politics of Santa Cruz a little bit more if you could, or you can speak about that a little bit? 
Um, and then with Lucia's question, um, I'm, I mean, I'm just curious, do you think, I don't know if there was a change in how people identified in Santa Cruz with the mosque, did less people identify as indigenous because of the mosque? Because I know that's, I was mm -hmm. placed there, it's very anti-mosque. And then, yeah, I'm wondering if that's gonna hurt them with their rights in general. I mean, yeah. for, based on Lucia's, but that's sort of- So actually my dissertation, when I decided to study Bolivia, I had already studied Chile. So I had data on Chile, I said, okay, so, what would be a good comparison for Chile? So in Chile, and when I did when I did this the experiment in Chile, I did it because there had been a huge growth in people self-identifying as indigenous in the census. So in 2002, roughly like 5% of Chileans self-identified as indigenous. And in the 2017 census, there was a 2012 census then, but we don't like to talk about that. <laughs> and the 2017 census, uh, almost 13% of, of, of Chileans self-identify as indigenous. So it was a huge growth, like more than double in relative terms, right? And I decided to study Bolivia because in Bolivia happened the exact opposite. So in 2001 in their census, roughly like 60% of the country self-identified as indigenous. And for the 2012 census, that went down to like around 40%. So there was a huge decline in people's sci-fi, even in like absolute terms, not only in relative terms, right? Like there were definitely less people self-identifying with this. And the more interesting thing, and I think it makes sense with, uh, I mean, hopefully it will make sense with your question, that that decline came mostly from people self-identifying as Aymara and Quechua. And actually people like, non-Aymara, non-Quechua indigenous people, the counts went up. And those were mostly, right, like not in the Andes. So is, there is definitely an, an idea of that, that, yeah, that this will, uh, that this sort of like, uh, in these situations, sort of like the changes in self-identification are huge. In the case of Bolivia, it has a lot to do with uh, support for mass, right? The 2012 census is right after like the Tibnis and that kind of, that sort of debate. So I think it really it really showed that that less people were self-identifying with this sort of majority indigenous people, and more people were self-identifying with this sort of minority indigenous people. Um, so yeah, and in the I mean. In the paper, like there, I have like this thing that it says something like, there's obviously sort of like ethnic and socioeconomic differences, but the idea sort of that many people are trying to sort of say is that sort of this regional cleavage is sort of like distinct, even if you take into account sort of ethnic composition differences and socioeconomic differences. We have time. Uh, adding my voice uh, to everybody else's who said thank you very much for a really excellent presentation. Um, I have a, a question not about the research itself, but about your experience uh, doing the research, if I may. Um, and with just brief context for where the question's coming from, I'm taking a class right now that kind of sits at the intersection of ethnography and linguistics. Um, and two of the core concepts, neither of which are groundbreaking that we discussed in the class, is uh, first, um, many research projects sort of change in scope or in objective as the research progresses. You go into a, you know, a research project with one question, you discover that actually is a better question to ask after you've gotten started. And on uh, the linguistic side, uh, and kind of bringing it back to your survey questions, uh, the way that you phrase questions and the way that you frame questions that you ask people influences your results. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to know uh, sort of how your project, how your research has evolved since it began. Um, and uh, have you discovered anything particularly surprising to you over the course of your research? You didn't expect to see that you did. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, oh, I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> I've discovered things. I've discovered things. For example, the thing, one of the things that I thought was 
that surprised me the most is that in all these components of ethnicity that I show you, the, the three different definitions of ethnicity, none of them include, really include indigenous languages. I thought people were going to be much more, so like I included two dimensions related sort of like to cultural dimension, right? So either people are interested in culture and the other one is this person learn an indigenous language in their childhood, which for me, like it sounds like very indigenous, right? But yet in Bolivia, that seems not to be a very important thing. And it's way more important to say like something as feeble as, oh, I'm interested in culture seems to be much more important than you learning an indigenous language. You know, the Bolivian constitution actually does not recognize 36 indigenous nations, it recognizes 36 indigenous languages. So, and historically, there is an under the, uh, many countries until very recently, for example, Peru would measure indigeneity not by self identification, but by identifying your mother tongue. So, there has been a long history of sort of identifying indigenous languages as sort of like a sign of, of, of indigeneity. And I was surprised to see that that wasn't the case. Even sort of in the more sort of the ones that I termed traditionalists, even in those cases, indigenous languages don't seem to appear as like sort of like the criteria. I think that's one of the things that sort of surprised me the more, the most. What was the other question, sorry? Um, thank you so much, fascinating. Um, and the other question was just, how is your research project? Oh, they evolved. Oh uh, yeah, well, I actually, as I said, I did the, uh, the experiment in Chile first. So, uh, like the second experiment, I uh, got a lot of experience. I got a lot of experience out of that. Um, I decided to make a few changes in the way that I did, uh, that I made the vignettes. Fewer dimensions. Uh, this sort of confounded block design that I didn't have before. And I also took out, uh, in the experiment in Chile, I had both uh, male and female names with both paternal and maternal last names. I took that out in the case of Bolivia because, sort of, well, we know that uh, there's research saying that indigenous, like gender is very important in the Andes, right? When it comes to indigenous people and that literally women are more indigenous than men. Uh, so I thought that that might be complicated things. And also it implied adding too many dimensions because then I have to vary names, like first names, and then add maternal last name. So it just like, it blew up. But it certainly made me see sort of like, or at least take into account this gender question that I didn't, like I, I didn't even think about it when I worked in Chile. Um, and the other question is that, well, in that first experiment, it was part of like a different survey. So I didn't have many questions about attitudes and that stuff. So when I did the project in Bolivia, like this was like, oh, this is like I'm on my dream survey. I get to put everything, but then you have to do it like in 15 minutes. So it can't be all that much. But yeah, I added all these questions about, well, uh, about the meaning of the boundary. Most of those questions, so, in sociology, when you design a survey or like you design a survey in anything, you want questions that sort of have been tested before. So many of the questions that I use, like the ones that like I show you here, those come from the um, from like the barometer, like the Latin, no oh, one of the, one of the, like the, but yeah, these are questions that have been tested have been tested in Bolivia, which for me is a lot to say. So I didn't really go on inventing many questions in that sense. And I just mostly rely on what has already been tested, tried and true. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so we can end there. Thank you so much. Thank you.